Andrew Jackson, Part Three, and more subservient. Edward Livingston of Louisiana, who wrote most of Jackson's documents when he commanded in New Orleans, was made Secretary of State. Lewis McLean of Delaware, Secretary of the Treasury. Lewis Cass, Governor for nineteen years of Michigan, Secretary of War. Levi Woodbury of New Hampshire, Secretary of the Navy. Roger B. Taney of Maryland, Attorney General. All distinguished for abilities. But even these able men were seldom summoned to a cabinet meeting. The confidential advisers of the President were Amos Kendall, afterwards Postmaster General, Duff Green, a Democratic editor, Isaac Hill, a violent partisan who edited a paper in Concord, New Hampshire, and was made second auditor of the Treasury, and William B. Lewis, an old friend of the general in Tennessee. All able men but unscrupulous politicians who enjoyed power rather than the display of it. These advisers became known in the party contests of the time as the President's Kitchen Cabinet. Jackson had not been long inaugurated before the influence of the Kitchen Cabinet was seen and felt, for it was probably through the influence of these men that the President brought about a marked change in the policy of the government and it is this change which made Jackson's administration so memorable. It was the intrusion of personality instead of public policy into the management of party politics. Madison did not depart from the general policy of Jefferson, nor did Monroe. The Virginia dynasty kept up the traditions of the government as originally constituted, but Jackson cut loose from all traditions and precedents, especially in the matter of assuming responsibilities and attempted to carry on the government independently of Congress in many important respects. It is the duty of the President to execute the laws as he finds them, until repealed or altered by the National Legislature. But it was the disposition of Jackson to disregard those laws which he disapproved, an encroachment hard to be distinguished from usurpation. And this is the most serious charge against him as President, not his ignorance, but his despotic temper, and his self-conceit in supposing himself wiser than the collected wisdom and experience of the representatives of the nation a notion which neither washington nor jefferson nor madison ever entertained again jackson's system of appointments to office the removal of men already satisfactorily doing the work of the government in order to make places for his personal and political supporters was a great innovation against all the experience of governments whether despotic or constitutional it led to the reign of demagogues, and gave rewards, not to those who deserved promotion from their able and conscientious discharge of duty and public trusts, but to those who most unscrupulously and zealously advocated or advanced the interests of the party in power. It led to perpetual rotations in office without reasonable cause, and made the election of party chiefs of more importance than the support of right principles. The imperfect civil service reforms which have been secured during the last few years with so much difficulty show the political mischief for which Jackson is responsible, and which has disgraced every succeeding administration, an evil so gigantic that no president has been strong enough to overcome it, not only injurious to the welfare of the nation by depriving it of the services of experienced men, but inflicting an onerous load on the president himself which he finds it impossible to shake off the great obstacle to the proper discharge of his own public duties, and the bar to all private enjoyment. What is more perplexing and irritating to an incoming president than the persistent and unreasonable demands of office-seekers, nine out of ten of whom are doomed to disappointment, and who consequently become enemies rather than friends of the administration? This spoils system which Jackson inaugurated has proved fatal to all dignity of office and all honesty in elections it has divested politics of all attraction to superior men and put government largely in the hands of the most venal and unblushing of demagogues it has proved as great and fatal a mistake as has the establishment of universal suffrage which jefferson encouraged a mistake at least in the great cities of the country and evil which can never be remedied except by revolution doubtless it was a generous impulse on the part of jackson to reward his friends with the spoils of office as it was a logical sequence of the doctrine of political equality to give every man a vote, whether virtuous or wicked, intelligent or ignorant. Until Jackson was entrusted with the reins of government, no President of the United States, however inclined to reward political friends, dared to establish such a principle as rotation in office or removal without sufficient cause. 
not one there was who would not have shrunk from such a dangerous precedent a policy certain to produce an inferior class of public servants and take away from political life all that is lofty and ennobling except in positions entirely independent of presidential control such as the national legislature the senate especially during jackson's administration was composed of remarkably gifted men the most distinguished of whom opposed and detested the measures and policy he pursued with such unbending obstinacy that he was filled with bitterness and wrath this feeling was especially manifested towards clay webster and calhoun the great lights of the senate chamber although jackson's party had the majority of both houses much of the time and thus while often hindered he was in the end unchecked in his innovations and hostilities but these three giants he had to fight during most of his presidential career which kept him in a state of perpetual irritation their opposition was to him a bitter pill they were beyond his power as independent as he until then in his military and gubernatorial capacity his will had been supreme he had no opponents whom he could not crush he was accustomed to rule despotically as president he could be defied and restrained by congress his measures had to be of the nature of recommendation except in the power of veto which he did not hesitate to use unsparingly but the senate could refuse to ratify his appointment and often did refuse which drove him beyond the verge of swearing again in the great questions which came up for discussion especially those in the domain of political economy there would be honest differences of opinion for political economy has settled very little and is not therefore strictly a science any more than medicine is it is a system of theories based on imperfect inductions there can be no science except what is based on indisputable facts or accepted principles there are no incontrovertible doctrines pertaining to tariffs or financial operations which are modified by circumstances the three great things which most signally marked the administration of jackson were the debates on the tariffs the quarrel with the united states bank and the nullification theories of calhoun it would seem that jackson when inaugurated was in favor of a moderate tariff to aid military operations and to raise the necessary revenue for federal expenses but was opposed to high protective duties even in eighteen thirty one he waived many of his scruples as to internal improvements in deference to public opinion and signed the bills which made appropriations for the improvement of harbors and rivers and for the continuation of the cumberland road for the encouragement of the culture of the vine and olive and for granting an extended copyright to authors it was only during his second term that his hostility to tariffs became a passion not from any well-defined views of political economy for which he had no adequate intellectual training but because protection was unpopular in the southwestern states and because he instinctively felt that it favored monopolists at the expense of the people what he hated most intensely were capitalist and moneyed institutions like jefferson he feared their influence on elections as he was probably conscious of his inability to grasp the complex questions of a political economy he was not bitter in his opposition to tariffs except on political grounds hence generally speaking he left congress to discuss that theme we shall have occasion to look into it in the lecture on henry clay and here only mention the great debates of jackson's time on the subject a subject on which congress has been debating for fifty years and will probably be debating for fifty years to come since the whole matter depends practically on changing circumstances whatever may be the abstract theories of doctrinaires while jackson then on the whole left tariffs to congress he was not so discreet in matters of finance his war with the united states bank was an important episode in his life and the chief cause of the enmity with which the moneyed and conservative classes pursued him to the end of his days had he let the bank alone he would have been freed from most of the vexations and turmoils which marked his administration he would have left a brighter name he would not have given occasion for those assaults which met him on every hand and which history justifies he might even have been forgiven for his spoils system and unprecedented removals from office in attacking the bank he laid a profane touch upon a sacred ark and handled untempered mortar he stopped the balance wheel which regulated the finances of the country and introduced no end of commercial disorders ending in dire disasters like the tariff finances were a question with which he was not competent to deal his fault was something more than the veto on the recharter of the bank by congress which he had a constitutional right to make it was a vindictive assault on an important institution before its charter expired even in his first message to congress in this warfare we see unscrupulous violence 
prompted not alone by his firm hostility to everything which looked like a monopoly and a moneyed power but by the influence of advisers who hated everything like inequality of position especially when not usable for their own purposes they stimulated his jealousy and resentments they played on his passions and prejudices they flattered him as if he were the monarch of the universe incapable of a wrong judgment hostility to the money power however is older than the public life of jackson it existed among the american democracy as early as the time of alexander hamilton when he founded the first bank of the united states he met with great opposition from the followers of jefferson who were jealous of the power it was supposed to wield in politics when in eighteen ten the question came up of renewing the charter of the first united states bank the democratic republicans were bitter in their opposition and so effective was the outcry that the bank went into liquidation its place being taken by local banks these issued notes so extravagantly that the currency of the country as stated by professor sumner was depreciated to twenty five per cent so great was the universal financial distress which followed the unsound system of banking operations that in eighteen sixteen a new bank was chartered on the principles which hamilton had laid down the bank was to run for twenty years and its capital was thirty five millions of dollars seven of which were taken by the united states many of its stockholders were widows charitable institutions and people of small means its directors were chosen by the stockholders with the exception of five appointed by the president of the united states and confirmed by the senate the public money was deposited in this bank it could be removed by the secretary of the treasury but by him only on giving his reasons to congress the bank was located in philadelphia then the money center of the country but it had twenty five branches in different cities from portsmouth new hampshire to new orleans the main institution could issue notes not under five dollars but the branches could not langdon cleves of south carolina was the first president succeeded in eighteen twenty three by nicholas biddle of philadelphia a man of society of culture and of leisure a young man of thirty-seven who could talk and write perhaps better than he could manage a great business the affairs of the bank went on smoothly for ten or twelve years and the financial condition of the country was never better than when controlled by this great central institution nicholas biddle of course was magnified into a great financier of uncommon genius the first business man in the whole country a great financial autocrat the idol of philadelphia but he was hated by democratic politicians as a man who was entrusted with too much power which might be perverted to political purposes and which they asserted was used to help his aristocratic friends in difficulty moreover they looked with envy on the many positions its offices afforded which as it was a government institution they thought should be controlled by the governing party among biddle's especial enemies were the members of the kitchen cabinet who with sycophantic adroitness used jackson as a tool isaac hill of new hampshire was one of the most envenomed of these politicians who hated not only biddle but those who adhered to the old federalist party and rich men generally he had sufficient plausibility and influence to enlist levi woodbury senator from new hampshire to forward his schemes in consequence woodbury on june twenty seventh eighteen twenty nine wrote to ingham secretary of the treasury making complaints against the president of the branch bank in portsmouth for roughness of manner partiality in loans and severity in collections the accused official was no less a man than jeremiah mason probably the greatest lawyer in new england if not of the whole country the peer as well as the friend of webster ingram sent woodbury's letter to biddle intimating that it was political partiality that was complained of then ensued a correspondence between biddle and ingham the former defending mason and claiming complete independence for the bank as to its management so long as it could not be shown to be involved in political movements and the latter accusing threatening to remove deposits attempting to take away the pension agency from the portsmouth branch etc it was a stormy summer for the bank thus things stood until november when a letter appeared in the new york courier and inquirer stating that president jackson in his forthcoming first annual message to congress would come out strongly against the bank itself and sure enough the president in his message astonished the whole country by a paragraph attacking the bank and opposing its recharter the part of the message about the bank was referred to both houses of congress the committees reported in favor of the bank as nothing could be said against its management again in the message of the president in eighteen thirty he attacked the bank and benton one of the chief supporters of jackson in spite of their early duel declared in the senate that the charter of the bank ought not to be renewed 
here the matter dropped for a while as jackson and his friends were engrossed in electioneering schemes for the next presidential contest and the troubles of the cabinet on account of the eaton scandal had to be attended to as already noted they ended in its dissolution followed by a new and stronger cabinet in which ingham was succeeded as secretary of the treasury by lewis mclean it was not till eighteen thirty two the great session of jackson's administrations that the contest was taken up again the bank aimed to have its charter renewed although that would not expire for five years yet and as the senate was partly hostile to the president it seemed a propitious time for the effort jackson on the other hand fearing that the bank would succeed in getting its charter renewed with a friendly congress redoubled his energies to defeat it the more hostile the president showed himself the more eager were the friends of the bank for immediate action it was with them now or never if the matter were delayed and jackson were re-elected it would be impossible to secure a renewal of the charter while it was hoped that jackson would not dare to veto the charter on the eve of a presidential election and thus lose perhaps the vote of the great state of pennsylvania so it was resolved by the friends of the bank to press the measure five months were consumed in the discussion of this important matter in which the leading members of the senate except benton supported the bank the bill to renew the charter passed the senate on the eleventh of june by a vote of twenty-eight to twenty and the house on the third of july by a majority of thirty-three it was immediately vetoed by the president on the ground that the bank was an odious monopoly with nearly a third of its stock held by foreigners and not only odious but dangerous as a money power to bribe congress and influence elections the message accompanying the veto was able and was supposed to be written by edward livingston or amos kendall biddle remained calm and confident like clay he never dreamed that jackson would dare to persist in a hostility against the enlightened public sentiment of the country but jackson was the idol of the democracy who would support all his measures and condone all his faults and the democracy ruled as it always will rule except in great public dangers when power naturally falls into the hands of men of genius honesty and experience almost independently of their political associations the veto aroused a thunder of debate webster and clay leading the assault upon it and benton with other jacksonians defending it the attempt to pass the recharter bill over the veto failed of the necessity two-thirds majority and the president was triumphant jackson had no idea of yielding his opinions or his will to anybody least of all to his political enemies the war with the bank must go on but its charter had three or four years still to run all he could do legally was to cripple it by removing the deposits his animosity inflamed by the denunciations of benton kendall blair hill and others became ungovernable mclean was now succeeded in the treasury department by mr duane of philadelphia the firmest and most incorruptible of men for whom the president felt the greatest respect but whom he expected to bend to his purposes as he had ingham only the secretary of the treasury could remove the deposits and this mr duane unexpectedly but persistently refused to do jackson brought to bear upon him all his powers of persuasion and friendship duane still stood firm then the president resorted to threats all to no purpose at length duane was dismissed from his office and roger b taney became secretary of the treasury twenty third of september eighteen thirty three three days afterwards taney directed collectors to deposit the public money in certain banks which he designated it seems singular that the man who two years later was appointed chief justice of the supreme court and who discharged the duties of that office so ably and uprightly should so readily have complied with the president's desire but this must be accounted for by the facts that in regard to the bank taney's views were in harmony with those of jackson and that the removal of the deposits however arbitrary was not unconstitutional the removal of more than nine millions from the bank within the period of nine months caused it necessary to curtail its discounts and a financial panic was the result which again led to acrimonious debates in congress in which clay took the lead his opposition exasperated the president in the highest degree calhoun equaled clay in the vehemence of his denunciation for his hatred of jackson was greater than his hostility to moneyed corporations webster was less irritating but equally strong in his disapproval jackson in his message of december eighteen thirty three reiterated his charge against the bank as a permanent electioneering engine attempting to control the public opinion through the distresses of some and the fears of others the senate passed resolutions denouncing the high-handed measures of the government which however were afterwards expunged when the senate had become democratic 
one of the most eloquent passages that clay ever uttered was his famous apostrophe to vice president van buren when presiding over the senate in reference to the financial distress which existed throughout the country and which of course he traced to the removal of the deposits deputations of great respectability poured in upon the president from every quarter to induce him to change his policy all of which he summarily and rudely dismissed all that these deputations could get out of him was go to nicholas biddle he has all the money in eighteen thirty four during the second term of jackson's office there were committees sent to investigate the affairs of the bank who were very cavalierly treated by biddle so that their mission failed amid much derision he was not dethroned from his financial power until the united states bank of pennsylvania the style under which the united states bank accepted a state charter in eighteen thirty six when its original national charter expired succumbed to the general crash in eighteen thirty seven End of section 3